And this is where we have an issue with it when the government then comes in and bails them out um, because it seems like they have a policy that put them at a disadvantage and then they're using taxpayer dollars to bail them out. But in the long run, what should happen is those companies should downsize. The bankruptcy process should work as they begin to create products that they ultimately mirror the consumer's uh, demands. And I think that we really saw that in the, the lead up to the financial crisis, especially when oil was getting higher, was that consumers were really demanding higher efficiency vehicles. And we think that it's ultimately the consumer and the market price orientation that should be dictating how and when consumers uh, drive different vehicles. Mm -hmm. And we don't think that that policy um, necessarily had wonderful uh, impacts on the uh, manufacturing sector. And when we look at regulation, we think that the cost of the regulation needs to match its benefit. And um, sure. we looked at this as something where the costs were tremendous and did not match the benefits. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, let me add uh, one additional point. You know, we're keeping interest rates artificially low, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that companies that would not be able to stand uh, market conditions, right now, because of the very low interest rates, they are able to borrow and they are able to survive in a situation where they would normally not survive. The Wall Street Journal had an article a few weeks back about, you know, a manufacturer <coughs> that was, you know, way into debt. And I mean, you know, obviously under normal conditions, this manufacturer had to go under. Yet because of the artificially low interest rates, what happened was that the manufacturing was, was surviving. Therefore, what people fail to understand that the minute you fool around and intervene in markets, there are consequences that people do not foresee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and therefore, you know, then the markets do not work. And lo and behold, the politicians come up and say, oh, capitalism is failing. The free market is failing. Well, that is not the case. What is happening is that there is so much intervention in the markets mm -hmm. that therefore what is taking place is that the markets find it very difficult to function because of the intervention. And, you know, what, when you mention the, the CAFE laws that, uh, you know, impose standards on, you know, this particular producer, you know, of cars and so on and so forth, in, in effect, it is intervening in the market process where the American companies could, could have developed a niche mm -hmm. in the larger cars. And mm -hmm. maybe the Japanese companies could have developed, you know, a niche in the smaller mm -hmm. cars. Sure. Yet what we did was try to force the American companies to produce something where you did not find that they had a comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. Well, you this book, although it reflects my own opinion on, on the bailouts, makes the strongest case I've seen okay. that the government that our government is, is a major cause of the economic crisis. Right. And, you know, we can touch more on that. I want to I put a thought out to you, though, that I hope we can touch on as we move forward. And that is my impression of government intervention into the economy is that it almost invariably favors what you could call the big boys. Right. Now, in this case, Ford didn't accept the bailouts, and they actually have prospered as a re partly as a result because they, they earned some credibility with the public <laughs> by not participating, in my humble opinion. But uh, let's move on from the, uh, the auto automobile sector to a number of others. Uh, let's, in fact, talk about the, the financial crisis where you've made such a strong, face, strong case as to the, the government being uh, a major cause. Um, what do you think has been the effect of the government's intervention on the financial sector? And God, we haven't begun to see the, what you already referred to as unintended consequences. We're going to touch on that in the health sector as well. Right. But let's start with the financial sector. One thing uh, that struck me is you either were not able to because of the timing of the publication or you didn't choose to get into the legislation, which is now in effect. 
uh, so-called financial sector reform, whatever the bill title is, uh, what's, your, what's your opinion of the bill and what do you see as the, uh, as the consequences of the bill relative to the stated goals of the legislation. Well, again, I'm going to turn to Chris because it turned out that Chris not only wrote the chapter on the financial sector, mm -hmm. but worked in the financial industry this summer. And he, and he tells me he's going to continue in that. And thing. he's going to continue. <laughs> he will be making a lot of money, I suppose. Well, I'm, you, know, you might be the first of my rich friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we turn <coughs> to Chris. Um, unfortunately, I think that the goal of the bill is to create a stable financial system. Um, unfortunately, what it's done is it's um, led to an increasing concentration of um, power within a few select banks. Um, there's at least six or seven banks, in my opinion, that the government can and will never let go. And the issue of having such a policy is um, it just fuels the risk-taking machine. So uh, unfortunately, um, this bill- uh, Have we increased moral hazard? Oh, uh, to <laughs> proportions um, that only Goliath would understand. So, um, unfortunately, that that was the end result of this bill. Mm -hmm. Is uh, it really failed to take the risk taking out? If you look at the um, value at risk of the major banks, it's higher than it's ever been. Um, they're taking the risk. It's well, they're the using the money, the the low cost money from the federal government. It seems to me to trade. Yeah, just one of the factors that got us into uh, this mess. Yeah, they're, instead mean, of to lending. Well, if they're exploiting gaps in. Uh, making various arbitrage trades, especially with the treasuries, which is leading to a, um, <laughs> a bubble in the treasury market, in my opinion. Uh, but, um, good point. <laughs> but that's, that's the uh, end result. Unfortunately, I don't think that the consumer is ultimately going to be the person who's going to win. I think that there was some modest reform in terms of um, th the disclosure and the way that credit card companies are going to have to operate the way um, the mortgage industry is going to operate. But I think mm -hmm. that ultimately that's going to be very tangential. Um, at the end of the day, you have banks that are trading on their own accounts that are still going to be allowed to do that with a certain percent of their tier one capital. Um, mm -hmm. And so long as those right. operations exist and are subject to government bailouts, which under the Bank Holding Companies Act, which is what most of the m large investment banks now, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, only two mm -hmm. freestanding ones. That's left. why they're able to qualify as banks and yeah, so, uh, so right <laughs> <laughs> qualify for federal for federal aid, right? So, so right <laughs> now you have the investment banks um, with all the uh, backstops of the commercial banking se sector still doing investment banking activity. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a very, very um, profitable enterprise for them and uh, with, with a wonderful uh, safety net. Which now, tell us about the Volcker rule while you're at it, because how does that come in? I mean, Paul Volcker had a pretty mm -hmm. strong opinion on this matter well, of, of risk trading by banks. Exactly. Well, firms that are trading on their own accounts, um, his view is that they should be separated um, and be independent entities that are not uh -huh. that do not have the backstops backstops of the government. And uh, you know, I think that's a very reasonable um, reasonable viewpoint because those are the <coughs> types of operations that will lend that will put a bank into a lot of trouble trouble very quickly. And um, I don't really think that it's in the best interest of the country or the average uh, consumer to be backstopping. Um, Goldman Sachs's stat ARB operation, which is essentially what's happening right now, which you know makes tremendous value for their shareholder, shareholders in good times, but in bad times you can have significant wind downs of capital in um, mm -hmm. very short amounts of time, and this can lead to a run on the bank. So, uh, Peter, Professor. may I make a suggestion? Because you mentioned the word moral hazard. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, that my experience at, at least, is that a lot of people do not understand what moral hazard is. Please, you've done a great job in this book of explaining basic terms for your readers. <laughs> Please do, well, do so now. Well, no, I don't want to do it. I would like uh, Francis because he was the one who wrote about moral hazard okay. in the book. <laughs> Right. So we, we talked a little bit about moral hazard within the financial sector. The way we define moral hazard and the way, uh, the way it's really defined in, in the economics literature is that moral hazard can occur in pretty much any sector of the economy or any, any, any sector of life, really. Moral hazard is, uh, at its most basic point, the tendency of humans to not protect something as much, uh, something that is insured as much as if they bore the costs of the risks that they take 
themselves without insurance. So it's mm -hmm. the impact of insurance on people's decision making uh, with regards to an asset or to to financial. So they feel they're insured, they may take more risk. Correct. So our, our basic example is somebody that has a, a vehicle and isn't insured. If you've got a, a nice BMW, for example, and, and it's not insured, you're going to be very careful. I personally, I probably wouldn't take it out of the garage uh, if, if it wasn't insured, um, especially having driven here for an hour in Massachusetts.